So we're going to start the afternoon session with the third panel, which is basically on sentiment analysis or analytics in social media or social data. Um, before we get started, I would like to encourage everybody to pay attention to the list that's going around. Um, because if you would like to join us to, for a more informal continuation of our day's conversation over dinner and drinks at the restaurant at the Sheraton, we need to give them a list so they know kind of at least how many people to expect. So please keep an eye out for the list going around. Ivan has it right now. And sign up, please. We'd love to continue the conversation a little more informally. The second um, logistic note that I'd like to make is that we've shifted the agenda slightly to accommodate some travel plans. And it works out really nicely because Stu is uh, a very nice fit in the sentiment analysis or the analysis group. So we've got now four speakers in this panel, so it will be a little bit longer, but by the same token, the fourth session of the day will be that much shorter, so we're going to end on time. So um, I'd like to open it up and uh, welcome Devon Shah to the podium. Sure. So I'll, I'll stand here. Is that, can everyone hear me? Um, so again, th thanks to the organizers for hosting this event, this conference slash workshop, whatever we're supposed to call it. Thank you again. Um, I was in the same room about six months ago giving a somewhat similar presentation. For, for those of you, I see some familiar faces. Some of this may be a bit uh, redundant, but I want to start with a kind of provocative claim and, and then use the talk to kind of elaborate the idea, and that is, that communication research, a lot of our work is really focused on what I'd call the reception effects paradigm. And that is that we look at the effects of messages on receivers of that information. And I think that's uh, uh, certainly been a powerful model that's proved very useful in understanding how communication has some effects. I think one of the limits of that is that you know a lot of our research then has been focused on directing messages to populations, especially in health settings with cognitive or motivational limits. So we see things like limited capacity processing models and message tailoring and framing studies. And again, these are powerful tools, but I think it, it leads us to miss an important aspect of what's happening in a social media environment. And what I want to talk about today is a platform that we've been working with at the University of Wisconsin, uh, uh, mainly through a center called CHESS, Center for Health Enhancement System Studies. Uh, CHESS is part of the SEEKER uh, uh, that uh, is helping fund this work. There's five of those seeker centers. Uh, Emily's part of one at the University of Michigan, and obviously there's one at Annenberg. Uh, 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 there's one uh, uh, also at Wisconsin, and there's two others. The one at Wisconsin is really focused around creating these kinds of social media platforms that allow people who are dealing with various kinds of chronic illnesses to connect with one another and provide social support. So here you see a very simple kind of model describing uh, uh, what a chess services and communication lines might look like. So you've got either patients or caregivers who are really accessing the system. They have some static information, and that might be interactively accessed, so it's not static in a pure sense, but it's fixed information. There's also communication features, which lets them talk to either their peers, experts, sometimes clinicians, or members, broader members of their social network. And then there's various coaching or interactive tools. I really want to focus on that middle uh, uh, box there of communication and looking at how information is exchanged within that kind of social network. So the data I'm going to talk about and use is data collected that was part of a larger RCT uh, testing the effects of this, this system. Uh, 325 women diagnosed with breast cancer in the last two months, and they were recruited from uh, Hartford Hospital, MD Anderson in Houston, and the UW-Madison. And in this system, um, these 325 women posted 18,000 messages that were read well over 100,000 times by the people who use the system. So the question I think immediately would come up when you look at something like this, you go, well, where's the big data in this? It's 325 cases. This doesn't seem like a big data problem. But I guess that brings me to the deeper question, which is what do we mean when we talk about big data? And I'm actually not a big fan of the term big data. <laughs> partly because I find it to be um, not very helpful in actually kind of zeroing in on the topics that I think kind of make what we're doing here in common. Um, so the first question that comes up when people talk about big data is how big must it be? 
And um, to me, when I talk to people in IT and in other fields that are dealing with large or complex data sets, what they talk about is big data to them is really a shorthand for talking about you know, the challenges of handling uh, uh, new kinds of data using conventional data processing approaches. So we need novel approaches. So this is really the challenges of gathering, curating, storing, retrieving, coding, harmonizing, analyzing, visualizing these data. And the term that I'm getting more and more comfortable with, and I think actually does kind of make those common lines among what we're all doing, is computational social science. And that, to me, is a better way of talking about the, these ideas that bring us together. And I think what I will share with you today is very much within that realm of computational social science. What I really want to focus on is in analyzing those 18,000 discussion posts and the over 100,000 times they were read, um, we could have coded those using conventional methods, but we used a computer-assisted or computer-aided content analysis technique and then had to harmonize that data with the more conventional forms of data collection that we used as part of that clinical trial, which were survey collections at various points in time uh, uh, during that trial. So uh, talk a little bit about the complexities of doing uh, computer-assisted content analysis. Uh, uh, Sherry, I think, talked so effectively about how language means different things uh, in different contexts. And oftentimes, we can't just code for a word, but we have to understand how that word is used in context with other words. I'll talk about that in terms of syntactical coding. I know others in, the, uh, in our panel will probably talk about machine learning. Um, there's also the question of merging coded data into more complex systems. And so the other part of what we do is not just code the language, but then look at every click and every keystroke that people do within this social networking system we've created. So then we can look at each one of those lines of code, literally tens of millions of lines of code, and find ways to harmonize our content coded data with that click level data, and then ultimately relate it back up to the survey level data. Um, and so really it's about combining both computational and conventional methods, and, and that's where I think the sweet spot is, at least for, for the research I'll talk about. So just to give you a better sense, when I talk about computer aided content analysis, I'm using a system called InfoTrend. InfoTrend was developed by David Fan at the University of Minnesota. He was actually an Annenberg Fellow here about a dozen years ago, I think. Um, uh, David's system is one that, as I said, deals with the syntactical complexity of language, and I'll talk about how it works in, in just a moment. Using that system, we wanted to code for emotional support, statements of empathy, encouragement, understanding, universality. These were statements like, um, I know what you're going through. We've been through this too. You know, we're all in this together. Um, and these are not easy things to code because some of those key words mean very different things. If I say, I understand what you're going through, it's not the same as I understand where you live. Understand means very different. Th understand means totally different things in those two contexts. So we have to really understand the words that surround it to have understand have some meaning. We take that computer aided content analysis data and we merge it with action log data, and that's the timestamp usage data of this whole social networking system and its use. And so using that, what we're able to do is say we know who wrote every single message and who read every single message. We know who posted a message at what point in time. And the amount of change they experience between zero and two weeks, two weeks and, and six weeks, six weeks and 12 weeks. So we can develop some very complex ways of actually looking at how these online interactions relate to outcomes that we care about. Um, and then the survey element here is, again, uh, uh, breast cancer patients from our Seeker 1 study, pre and post test measures at zero, two, six, 12, and 24 weeks. So, the computer-aided content analysis part of this work, again, to deal with the question of complexity, um, we begin, as many of us do, trying to define our categories. We start by doing a literature review, defining concepts and thinking about keywords, and then we do a keyword search of those 18,000 posts or 25,000 posts or sometimes 100,000 news stories, depending on what we're coding. And then we start with a grounded examination. Those keywords pop up with paragraphs or entries or posts, and we look at how that language is being used. And then we try to develop rules to code for that idea. And those of you who participated in the workshop I did here in the uh, 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 fall know at least a sense of how that works. I'll show some examples in a minute. The problem is rule creation never works well on the first run through because you create some rules and they kind of work for some of your examples. And then when you test them against new examples, they fail. So you have to keep, you see that kind of iterative line going back up, showing back to keyword search. We probably go through that cycle 60, 80 times to develop a good set of rules. So this is not the efficiency of machine learning. 
It's not 200, 300 examples, train the machine and the machine codes. This is a lot of very labor intensive work by human coders to develop a system that then the machine can then code a much vaster array of content, okay? So this is just a kind of brief sense of what uh, uh, is contained in that, as I said, this process takes a great amount of time. What it results in is this kind of coding system. So you have, here we're coding not for emotional, but instead for various kinds of informational content, surgical words, therapeutic words, testing words. And then down below you can see if a treatment word comes you know, in either direction within 30 characters of a feeling word, then that's not what we're talking about. We're not, we don't want to know how you felt about your surgery. We want to just treatment words in this case. For coding emotional content, it gets a lot more complicated, as you can see. So this is, is the eye test example, probably hard to see for most of us. But there's layers and layers of rules. So we're coding for various ideas, and then combining those ideas with other ideas within a certain distance to say that signifies a deeper or more complex idea, and then we can layer those ideas even further to get at even deeper meanings and subtleties and negation and alterations. And you know, there's certain things that are limited. We can't get at satire very well or, or uh, irony, but a lot of very complex language use, we can actually start to code using this kind of uh, syntactical coding system. So when you do computer-aided content analysis of a full network like this, it reveals certain things that uh, are kind of unavailable to us using more conventional means. So we're able to observe patterns of change, and we're able to understand what explains the change over time in how people are behaving and how they're communicating in the system. So just as an example, um, if we look at who is it that actually tends to express emotional support in these networks, one of the things we looked at was the level of emotional support expression increased for the first 12 weeks of our, our study period, our randomized clinical trial, and then started to decrease somewhat. So, set of questions. Um, who is it that starts higher or lower? The intercept. Who is it that changes the most? Do some people start to express more emotional support as time goes on and some less? The slope. And then, is, there, is that change linear or is it nonlinear? So we can do various quadratic forms to examine the shape of the data as well. So just to give you a quick example of this, this is again the intercept, the slope, and the quadratic, and what predicts uh, who is initially engaging in more emotional support and what explains change over time. So it turns out that uh, uh, um, initial expression of emotional support can be predicted by age and living status. Older, older women and women who are living alone tended to engage in more emotional support expression via the system. In terms of over time change, Comfort with computers and the internet predicted posting more for the first 12 weeks. But after that point in time, those same people posted less as they found other venues to go to and start to express their emotional support outside of the network we'd created. So these are the kinds of insights that become available when you do full network analysis of a system and code it for these kinds of complex features. But what I really want to talk about is another idea, and that is that, as I said at the beginning, I think a lot of our research is focused around the question of me delivering a message to you and the impact it has on you. And I'm becoming increasingly interested in when I communicate something, what effect does that message have on me as the communicator? And this goes back to the question I asked Emily about what happens when people are preparing and composing messages? What's happening in their mind? Um, and, and so this is a, a, a paper that we currently have under review at the, National, the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. Um, where we're testing two questions. One is just, does your use of this discussion system lead to a greater sense of perceived bonding and connection with the people in the system and ultimately to various forms of, of active coping that help people manage their illness more effectively? And then secondly, is it the emotional support expression or reception that's really driving that phenomenon? So first model, very simply, is just looking at the use of that online communication community. The number of messages posted, the number of minutes spent on there, it doesn't matter what variable you use. Um, what we find is, indeed, online community use has a positive effect on bonding, also a positive effect on active coping, but most of the effects are mediated through bonding on these various kinds of coping strategies, active coping, positive reframing, humor, et cetera. But more interesting is when we break down whether it was the posting of messages or the reading of messages, whether it was expression or reception, what we find is the effect on bonding seems to be almost purely driven by expression. By it's, it's the preparing and 
posting of messages, not so much the receiving of messages that's creating that sense of perceived bonding and ultimately shaping the effects on those outcome variables. So this is, I think, one example of um, how we can start to reframe our understanding, again, in terms of using big data as a way to gain new insights about how health works and how we can improve people's health uh, using these kinds of dynamic contexts. So to reduce people's health burden, I think we have to understand the role of social media and acknowledge their connections to others. I think, again, so many of our models are about how clinicians or experts communicate with the public. And we need to start thinking about how people are communicating with other people in this framework. And I think what this does, it gives us unique insights about network communication. It really is about combining you know, the computational with the conventional. And I think it's about how we marry those methods, which is, again, one of my big concerns about data harmonization and about interoperability of these systems. And then the next thing I just want to close by talking about the question of how we move up the scale and how we take what we have here with 325 women and how do we do the same thing, say, in the Twitterverse, where we have literally tens of millions of users. And that requires a lot of parallel processing capability. And so what I want to end with here is just to talk a little bit, and this is, again, I didn't anonymize Rachel Maddow, I apologize. Uh, um, this is uh, Rachel Maddow's post here. She's talking about the protests in Wisconsin. And clearly, tweets have a lot of different elements, right? We have the hashtag, we have the URL, we have the user mention. But this is just the surface of what's in a tweet. If you really want to understand what's in a tweet, this is what's actually in a tweet, OK? And it's literally, every tweet has not just the content of the tweet and the unique identifier, but also, you know, we mentioned earlier geolocation. In about 5%, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, actually geocoded based on them putting the geo function of their, uh, their uh, tablet or their, their uh, 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 smartphone on. But we also have things like how many followers does someone have? How many people are they following? How many lists are they on? How many times has that message been favorited? Um, what is the bio of the person who produced this particular uh, uh, piece of information? Um, has it been retweeted? Have, are they retweeting someone else's? All of this information is contained in that. And if for people who are interested in what's present within a tweet, you can go to that URL right there, which is, actually describes what is contained within a Twitter platform object. And frankly, it's amazing. It's not a survey full of data, but it's about half a survey full of data. It has a tremendous amount of information that you can then use to actually develop predictive models about how Twitter works and what kinds of tweets become most persuasive or go viral. Um, so using this, we're trying to extend the work that I just shared with you about expression effects by doing larger collections. And these are kind of multi-purpose collections. We're certainly using them for health. We're using them for politics as well. So we have the Garden Hose, which is a 10% collection of Twitter uh, using the enhanced API access. We also have a targeted sample because we have access to 80,000 active user accounts. Um, we're archiving about 30 to 40 million tweets daily. Uh, right now, we have about 11 billion tweets stored, and this just keeps growing on a daily basis. Um, we heard an example earlier. Our download volume is around 17 gigabytes per day. Uh, so much so that our university complained to us and said, you can no longer use the bandwidth that the university provides. You have to have your own T2 line. So that's also part of our expenses now is to actually get access to our own T2 line. Um, and this has produced about six terabytes of data so far, and we're, we keep building this. The, the infrastructure behind this, we're not storing this remotely. We're storing this at SSCC in uh, uh, Madison. And uh, it's, it costs about 20000 a year for this architecture and the support. But it creates the possibility for all kinds of content coding, for network analysis, for geomapping, and for looking at the question of virality. And uh, uh, what it also looks, let us look at is, uh, within that more structured collection, the question of how information flows from, say, elites, like candidates or party operatives or advocacy groups or media, to their followers. So to do this. Again, uh, uh, to Sherry's uh, uh, point, how are we doing this? We're using the RESTful API for collecting the follower list, and then the streaming API for actually collecting the tweets. And our structure for storing and retrieving this data is using Hadoop and MapReduce uh, uh, as the system. So I'll end there, and thank you for your attention, and uh, take questions later. Thank you.
College of Information Science and Technology at Penn State. Uh, thank you. It's my great pleasure to be here. Um, I realize some of you probably couldn't see me because I'm short. <laughs> so I try to move around. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm presenting uh, our research uh, conducted in collaboration with the American Cancer Society. Uh, one of The, the topic uh, that we'll be talking about is uh, analyzing sentiment uh, and, and topic and the leaders of an online community, uh, which is the one uh, cancer, I mean, cancer Society um, has uh, developed since 2000. Uh, 2000. Uh, two key collaborators of, of this project uh, are uh, Dr. Ken Portia uh, from American Cancer Society and Greta Greer. Uh, Dr. Boria is a managing director of the Statistic and Evaluation Center uh, at uh, ACS, and Greta is director of survivor programs. Uh, she also started uh, this online community uh, and has been uh, playing a key role in framing the community and, and nourishing it and, and so forth. Uh, we also have other uh, key uh, collaborators uh, in addition to uh, students, uh, graduate students, PhD students in our group also have uh, a formal PhD student now at the University of Iowa, Dr. Kang Zhao, and also formal postdoc, uh, Cornelia Karajia at the University of North Texas, and also others. Uh, it's great to follow the talk uh, about chess uh, because I think really uh, the, the context of the, this research is really uh, motivated actually by lots of wonderful work done by the chess and other uh, research team uh, looking at peer support through online whether it's online support uh, you know support groups or uh, online communities uh, based on the Pew survey uh, the, the percentage of people who actually read others experience related to health is actually quite significant, about one third uh, from the internet users. In addition to cancer survivors, um, we heard talks earlier today about uh, smoking, uh, you know, uh, tweets related to uh, smoking and, and, and others. So obviously many health related conversations now take place in social media, in tweets, in online forums, you know, this is I think a community that's very familiar with all of those. So some background about CSN, Cancer Survivor Network. Uh, it was established, as I mentioned, 2000, uh, and uh, it's the oldest and the largest of cancer online communities with uh, 160,000 members. Um, and the questions uh, we will be talking about today are driven by three uh, motivations. First one, uh, can we measure some of the impacts, like the one Devon talked about, uh, at the least large scale, uh, not controlled, naturally occurring online community, even though they were you know, obviously uh, nourished, shaped uh, by the administrator and have policy uh, and to, to make sure people don't go uh, overboard and, and so forth, but it's, it's not a clinical study. Uh, so, but obviously people have benefited from this kind of online community uh, through many uh, qualitative studies. So can we quantify some of those? Uh, what are the uh, topics being talked about? And are the topics related to you know, some of the impact? And thirdly, how can we find influential users or leaders from this community which play a very important role uh, because these communities are self-supporting uh, each other uh, 
uh, therefore, uh, you know, kind of a disappearance of leaders could have a major negative impact on the communities. Uh, we have heard lots of great talk today about social media. Um, obviously, social media analysis can take place uh, at many different levels. You know, just at a very, very simplistic uh, kind of view, we can think about social media analysis at the micro level or individual level, and the macro level at the broad, you know, a whole, you know, cyberspace level. Of course, there are many in between, you know, sub-community levels and so forth. And the kind of research questions and research theories that we draw upon for those different level uh, certainly varies, right? Reciprocity, uh, closing of triad is more at the micro level, even though you can, you can duplicate them and, and you kind of look at the macro level questions from those micro level uh, uh, phenomena. Viral, talk a lot today, obviously, is a macro level behavior, but, but still started, you know, as pointed out in the great talk earlier about neuroscience, it started still at the individual level about perceptions, about persuasion and all of that. Uh, but the phenomenon itself is, is very much macro level. Centrality, who are important? Leaders, they are macro level questions, but they still started to play a role at the, through interaction and influence, which take place both at the micro level and macro level. So really, if we think about it, everything is connected to this interaction and influence. And the influence take place in both ways. And as talk about you know, communication, obviously happen in both ways. We both speak and listen in the same time. Sometimes when we speak, we are also trying to understand the others. So the talk uh, try to use this insight of focusing on influence and use this to try to connect the three questions that I'll be talking about. Obviously, there have been a lot of wonderful work done about online health communities, talking about various benefits, including the wonderful work done at the chest, uh, about uh, identifying um, people who have participated in these communities or support groups. They have less stress, they, have, uh, they can cope with depression better, uh, they can view the condition uh, in a more positive way, even though you know, they, they are still you know, subject to risk of recurring and, and those kind of things. Um, so those provide uh, kind of a qualitative evidence for uh, us to pose these questions to say, well, given all of these wonderful studies, you know, can we do something computationally and quantitatively to try to quantify some of these effects and whether we can gain some insights through that? Uh, analysis. The Cancer Survivor Network um, consists of 38 discussion boards. Uh, most of those boards or subforums are cancer specific. Two largest are breast cancer and colon cancer. As, as you know, those are also the largest community among cancer survivors. Uh, the, the, there are many characteristic uh, regarding this uh, forum, which is kind of quite similar or common to other forums in terms of uh, distributions, long tail distributions, uh, in terms of a number of posts per user, there are a uh, small number of, relatively small number of very active users, uh, which I will talk to toward the end, which they are influential users. And there are also many users who post very little. Uh, of course, we know there are also many people who just you know, lurk, just observe, even though literature have shown they benefit also. But that's outside of the scope of this study. And the first step of our study is, uh, is try to assess individual state, in particular, uh, you know, what, what do they feel or what's their sentiment? Um, I, I use the sentiment here to refer uh, particularly to a cancer patient's emotion in terms of polarity. Do they feel positive? Do they feel negative? Now, there were a lot of interesting discussion about sentiment earlier, and so 
you know, I think itself is a very, very interesting question, and we are certainly also digging into it deeper, now doing more fine-grained sentiment, doing uh, both at the more sentence level and, and trying to link sentiment more to what the sentiment is about, right? In a, in a single post, there can be positive sentiment uh, about the, the healthcare providers, and negative sentiment about the drug, and then positive sentiment about themselves. Right. So, so sentiment, I agree, yes, it is a very, very complicated issue, especially if we think about health, you know, cancer survivors, they, they have different kinds of emotion mixed. But for this study, we focus on just kind of a high level sentiment to say, you know, when, uh, when a person read it, do, do they, what do they feel? Is it more positive or negative? And we build our work on the previous work in, in, in regarding sentiment analysis, which include techniques such as bag of word approach, uh, part of speech tagging, unsupervised learning. Uh, we use supervised learning uh, to tailor the sentiment classifier to this population. And in our experience, uh, even though one could use generic uh, sentiment uh, analysis, like Lewick and, and others, to do sentiment analysis, and there's also many online forums, you, you can just plug in and do all kinds of you know, uh, online analysis, but if you, the, the, the accuracy can certainly be improved we, if you consider the content um, of, the, of the sentiment analysis. And we chose uh, these features uh, which build on back word approach, which use the dictionary of positive word and negative word, also use the dictionary of the strength of those words, but we are able to add additional features uh, based on some of our qualitative insights, such as name. We notice that people mention name more often when the post is positive. You know, thank you, Mary. I agree with you, Bob. So forth. So we thought, hey, you know, let's try it. So one of the interesting thing about machine learning technique is that when we suggest, when we design a feature, we don't actually impose it. It is just some candidate for the program to consider. Whether, how, the, how, off, how important it is, it is still up to the program to figure out using the training data. And that's a big difference between, uh, between you know, well controlled, for example, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, keyword right, for, 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 uh, for the purpose of analysis. And we compare um, different kinds of uh, models, uh, I think in the machine learning community, it is uh, often understood that different kinds of classification problems may lend, them, lend themselves better to different kind of you know, uh, classification uh, framework. So uh, normally the best way to figure that out is try different approach and see which one works best. And in this case, uh, Ad Adabest, Adaboost is the one that performs best. And this is the set of features that were found to be useful. And one of the interesting things we notice is that this name feature, which I mentioned earlier, uh, turns out to be actually an important feature um, based on the program. And then the next step we wanted to know is, can we then use this sentiment, so then we you know, apply the classifier we learned, uh, or program learned, to all of the posts. Uh, and then we can, we can compare the sentiment of the person uh, along different, uh, in different time. In particular, we were interested in those who started a thread, because many people started a thread by uh, asking questions, by seeking help, even though not always. So as a first step, to understand impact, we thought we'll compare the sentiment of those people who started the thread with their sentiment later on the conversation to see whether there's a change. So we developed this sentiment change index, very simple way, I just take the average of the following reply from the person who started the thread and compare it with the original sentiment when they started the thread to see whether there's a difference. And we found that uh, there is a difference, actually a very significant difference. You know, 75% of those who start with a negative initial post became uh, more positive in self-reply. Now, of course, this is based on the program, right? <laughs> the program's assessment. It's not 100% accurate, 
but we have validated the sentiment and analyzer based on our own data set, and the accuracy is you know close to, to um, as I mentioned earlier, and one of the previous slides shows it, uh, comparable to other um, sentiment classified close to 80 percent. So the next question we we ask is, uh, can we gain some insight about this? Uh, and so we compare the sentiment change with some of the factors we thought might be related. And one of those is the sentiment of the other people who participate on the conversation, on the thread. And it turns out that they are related. Uh, more positive are the sentiment of the uh, people who reply to the thread. More, more significant is the sentiment change. We also compare the topic. So this topic are identified automatically using uh, unsupervised learning technique. Uh, and we then look at the sentiment change on this different topic and to see whether there are differences uh, among those topics. And it turns out there are. As one can imagine, a uh, topic, for example, these are the topics for breast cancer patient. Uh, and topic related to treatment side effect, they are top on the on this graph. So this graph, horizontal axis represents sentiment change. So more those who are more on the right hand means that they are more significant sentiment change. So we, we order the, the topic based on the degree of sentiment change. Those on the top are uh, topic related to um, um, side effect and uh, treatment procedures, especially severe treatment procedures. We also compare the sentiment change with the initial poll, initial sentiment, and we found that the, the, the initial sentiment uh, actually is also related to the change, which is understandable, right? Now, the, the more negative is the initial poll, then the more likely there is a significant positive change. So this graph shows horizontal is initial poll, uh, in, in, initial sentiment, the vertical axis is the sentiment change. Uh, and some of those that have negative initial posts on the left tends to have high sentiment change. And we done the similar analysis for the colon cancer community, and the result is also similar, that uh, the topic related to treatment and side effect, uh, pains, and so forth, are, are related to a conversation that lead to more significant sentiment change. And the last part of my talk is about leaders. Uh, there are many, many studies about leaders in network analysis. There are centrality measures about leaders. Uh, there are Google PageRank uh, as a way to find important uh, pages and, and so forth. Um, in our work, we find leaders through identifying uh, influential posts in the conversation. Because as I mentioned earlier, the influence uh, is really the, the key that connect micro level to macro level. So if we can find those posts who's, who are more influential to a person's sentiment change, then it is hopefully more likely that these are the people who are more influential. And we, by looking at how the sentiment uh, of those who study the threat changes over time, we found that most of the significant change occur early on the conversation. In particular, as shown in this graph, the, m most of the time, the first time the person who started the threat when they came back, uh, at that point, their sentiment change is much more significant <coughs> than later. So that suggests we focus on those posts in that early period of the threat. And, it, uh, and then, so we identified those posts during that period and um, uh, as an influential post. And we use those to uh, rank um, the, all of the peoples in the communities and then see how well they identify influential users, which has been identified by American Cancer Society. And they, in terms of a one measure, actually it is very, very uh, powerful and better than any other measure we have tried before. Uh, even more impressive, is we have tried to build a very complicated classifier using more than 60 features that consider contribution features, centrality features, semantic features, and build an ensemble classifier using five uh, computer programs uh, uh, together. And and turns out that these single sentiment-based predictors is actually uh, 
even better than, than that, uh, that complicated features. Um, and then, of course, the last thing we did was to combine the sentiment-based predictors uh, or sentiment-based measures of influential users uh, together with the uh, complicated classifiers, uh, and then that gave us the best result, which can give us 100% recall of the 125 influential users out of 150 people. So in summary, uh, we believe that sentiment analysis even the sim relatively simplistic approach we demonstrated uh, kind of a revealed important findings, both in terms of the impact of those uh, which have been documented in the literature, but also enable us to be able to uh, look on additional interactions related to uh, those impacts, such as the sentiment of other people, such as the timing of those replies, and then those insights can help us to, to develop better um, communication technique and, and uh, interventions to help to uh, improve the quality of life. Thank you. That was super interesting. Thank you. Our next speaker is um, Sandra gonzalez Baya. From Oxford, and seem to be from here, I understand. And you know, I think we can put that back in the center. Okay. Nice. Does this work? Yeah, in front. Okay. Well, so I'm not. I'm not going to talk about sentiment analysis, and I'm not going to talk. What's my name? Um, about health. Um, my aim with this talk is um, to put on the table some additional ideas um, to continue the discussions we've been having so far. And in particular, I want, to, um, I want to defend the claim that what's interesting about big data is not so much the size of the data, but rather the way in which we can reduce that data. Um, you said that you're not a fan of big data. We, we said something similar before. I think none of us really are big fan. Each of us has a different idea of what big data is. I think... Um, you know, the, the important part of big data is not so much the size. Size matters, if only because, as you mentioned, it requires a whole new strategy to store and manage in the most efficient way all that information. And you have to have the right infrastructure and the uh, right logistics in place to do so. And this is the reason why um, computer scientists should be best friends with social scientists um, doing research with big data or social media more generally. That's not the only reason, but that's an important reason. Um, so size matters because it changes things. But I would say that there is one element that is more important or valuable with big data, and, and that is the higher spatial and temporal resolution of the data. Um, which also, and, and the, all these ideas have been coming up um, in the discussions we've been having so far. You know, big data also is interesting because it, it, it often spans several levels of analysis. So you can go from individual behavior to collective dynamics. And it is this improved granularity uh, what makes big data so powerful but at the same time so challenging um, to analyze because at the end of the day you have to aggregate the data um, in a certain way. Um, you know, if you want to analyze um, spatial dynamics or temporal dynamics, you have to filter it in such a way that you're capturing the relevant information, so whatever you're interested in, um, and you can disregard the noise. Um, and so for that you need to filter the data to tap into the stream of information that is relevant for your research question. And so hence the title of my presentation, The Importance of Sampling and Filtering and Aggregation Rules. Again, my research experience is not on health, but political communication. I, I guess um, all, everything that I would say today would be relevant anyway, because um, we all face the same methodological issues. Most of my empirical work has actually used Twitter communications, so, uh, Twitter data. So when I talk about social media, I am probably thinking about, about Twitter, but again, most of the things that I will be discussing are not specific to a particular platform, or I'd like to think that they are not specific to a particular platform. And so we start with sampling. Um, I guess there's two types of sampling when it comes to analyzing social media data. Uh, one is a sampling that you choose based on hashtags or, or keywords that you use to identify the relevant stream of information um, or the number, a number of seed users that you will then use to um, um, to snowball and reconstruct, say, the kind of networks that, that the previous talk was referring to. Um, and there's several ways in which you can reconstruct networks of communication. And then there's the sampling that you don't choose, and that's where APIs come in. Um, and they are imposed by these black boxes we call application programming interfaces. Um, 
Most often than not, they do not give you access to the full stream of information, as we've been discussing, certainly not Twitter. And so um, what you get is certainly not a random sample of all communication, of all activity. And that's the kind of bias that we as researchers cannot um, control. Now, keywords are important because they are the starting point to disentangle what is relevant from, um, uh, from what's not relevant. The key aspect here is how you choose those keywords. If you're using the search API, the Twitter search API, there's a limit um, to retrospective data gathering. So um, if you suddenly realize uh, that there's one hashtag that, was, that is very important to map whatever you want to map, and you can only go back up for about a week. That's about it. So you cannot really sort of reconstruct what happened in the past. And so if you miss the relevance of some hashtags and when it's too late, it's too bad, but you cannot really go um, um, back in time. If you're using the streaming API, you're collecting data as it is being produced. And the good thing about it is that you can update the list of keywords as you are tracking that communication. And again, you probably, what are the unknowns unknowns? Well, so you can use co-mention of hashtags in order to identify other relevant hashtags that you didn't think about. And the good thing about the streaming API is you can keep on updating those lists. Um, then once you have those um, messages, you can use the user ID associated to those messages to reconstruct the following follower networks. Um, but also most importantly, for most of the interesting questions that we communication scholars might want to answer, you can um, reconstruct actual um, communication networks via mentions or retweets, um, which are often used to identify opinion leaders. I'm not sure there's a consensus of how do you define leadership in online communication. There's several approaches. So is the leader the most central person in the following follower structure, the most mentioned person? Do leaders change from information domain to information domain? Well, they do. Um, and so obviously there's two types of biases here. One is the biases that you have in the original subset of messages that you collected via the APIs. And then you have the sort of bias that you inherit from those messages, and the second order bias that you get when you reconstruct communication networks on the basis of those messages. And so the question is how representative are these sample communication networks of the, of the overall and hidden communication structure that we are uh, trying to, to map. And some of you have probably seen this before. I mean, I've, I've talked about this before, but I'm talking about it again because I think it's very relevant for the purposes of this workshop. Again, this is where APIs become relevant because as we've been saying all, uh, over and over again, they are filtering the information in a way that you don't control. Um, when you only have access to about 1% of the full stream of communication through the Spritzer um, um, access, um, which is what most of us have access to, um, you surely have a bias in your data. And sort of how is that affecting whatever conclusions you can draw from the data? It probably changes depending on the question that you want to answer, but you have to account for that. Um, and someone asked this morning, I think it was you, um, Cheryl, so who, why don't we ask them uh, whether there is a bias or not? So someone said, so we, why, why don't we just ask Twitter people to tell us what, what's the sort of bias? I'm um, um, one of those who think that they actually probably don't really know how, you know, because it very much depends on those filters. So, so the 1% can be higher or lower depending on the actual stream of information that you are interested in. Now, me and my colleagues try to start answering that question. This is a working paper. It's under review. Um, but we actually collected um, um, two samples of, uh, uh, from Twitter about the same um, stream of communication. So in this case, it's, it's uh, political communication about Spanish protests. We collected two independent samples using the two publicly available APIs, the search API, and so that's sample A and the streaming API, that's sample B. And so uh, what you have on the table is a comparison of those um, data sets. As you can see, this uh, search API yielded a smaller data set than the streaming API. Interestingly enough, even though the overlap is, uh, is, is very high, so most of the messages that we got in the small sample were also in the large sample, it's not complete. So we still get information in the small um, sample that we wouldn't have got um, in the large sample. And so the scatter plots, uh, so we, uh, on the basis of those samples, we reconstructed the mentioned networks and the retweet networks um, as a way of assessing more direct channels of communication between users. And then what the scatter plots are mapping here is how consistent sort of uh, measures of centrality that you can build on the basis of those networks are according to the two samples. Agreement is pretty high for the most central users in the network, so when degree is high, then you, uh, both samples um, agree. But there's way more noise in the periphery. 
And so that's a sort of bias that you get. That you get. So a, sort of the, the samples of all Twitter activity that you get through the APIs is biased towards the most central um, users in the network. In other words, is biased towards the most active users. Now, is this important? Well, it depends. If we are interested in what we might call leaders, so those who are more active than average, those who are at the center of the network, both samples give a pretty consistent picture of that network. But if we're interested in diffusion dynamics and how information spreads and how you reach a critical mass, then the periphery matters because that's where most users are. And so that's where you get most of the noise. And I'm, you know, so I'm not saying that that's, um, you, know, you can still do things with your data, but you have to account for these bias in order not to overstretch uh, whatever uh, your analysis tell you. So second issue, filtering. Again, you've probably seen this picture before because I keep on using it. This comes from a paper by Conover and co-authors um, entitled Political Polarization on Twitter. And I really like it and I use it all the time because it illustrates very well why filtering can have important consequences in how you understand your data. So on the left, there is a retweet network. On the right, the mentions network. So, you know, so you're, you're using, they're using the same set of messages. In this case, um, it's a subset of messages about sort of people communicating about elections and politics. Um, what changes is how they operationalize a relationship between two users. So in one case, it's when one user retweets another user. That's when they are connected. In the second case, it's when a user mentions another user, and that mention is not part of a retweet. So it's a filter. So they have two different filters applied to the same data. And um, as you can see, uh, well, and the colors are classifying nodes according to some community detection based on ideological leaning. And as you can see, the conclusions that you would draw from this data regarding whether or not you find evidence of polarization are radically different. Um, so uh, you know, if you only look at the retweet network, it's pretty obvious that you know, there's polarization. If you look at the Manchester network, there's not you know, the evidence at all. What does this mean? And what if their researchers had only used the retweet network and they had chosen not to show us the mentioned network. Um, so again, how you filter your data really matters in order to understand the communication dynamics that you are trying to understand, and they can lead to very different conclusions. Um, now, another example. This comes from one of the Facebook data science posts. Cameron Marlowe did this, I think. Um, and so here, well, this is a kind of, we were saying this morning about meritocracy or fair access to data. I mean, yes. I mean, uh, so Facebook, probably they have worked very hard to get the, sort of the privileges that they have right now, but they have access to data that we would never be able to access. For instance, who clicks on which links and who visits whose profiles. That's the kind of data that we would never, for privacy reasons, but also because their business model relies on them having privileged access to that information, right? But what I want to show with this is that you can reconstruct the network, in this case, um, of, of Facebook friends in very different ways if, depending on how you operationalize, again, the connection. So, um, so we have ego at the center of the network. What surrounds ego are all their friends. And so you have the full network um, on the upper left cell. Then ne the network changes depending on how stringent your definition of the connection between two um, users is. And so you know, if you define a connection between two users as mutual communication, so repeated communication exchange via wall posts or messages, um, which we could argue is a better proxy to a strong connection. So you're closer, you're more likely to know in person um, another user to whom you are all the time corresponding. And then, you know, the, the kind of network that you can get out of that is very different. And so again, how you filter your data um, might give you different insights um, into the social system that you're interested in. Um, um, but again, um, you have to determine how you're going to filter your data and what, what's the theoretical motivation for doing so. If you're interested about string and weak, strong and weak ties, then this is a very good way of assessing who are strong contacts and who are weak contacts. And both types of ties have different implications for things like information diffusion. But it's a theoretical ch uh, uh, choice. You still have to think and justify why you are filtering your data in the, way, in the way that you are. And obviously, the more access you have, the bigger your data, the more filtering options you get. Um, um, and so. Finally, there's the issue of time aggregation. Again, if you're interested in longitudinal dynamics, how you aggregate your data time-wise will also have an impact on the sort of conclusions you can draw from your data. Most online communication messages, they always have um, timestamps, and you can use that to build time series. Um, and so that's very good because social networks are non-stationary objects. They keep on changing and evolving. And before ICTs were um, you know, here and uh, before we could access digital data, 
we usually had to work with snapshots of networks or at best measure networks um, you know, with sort of twice every few months and then see how they change. Now we have essentially continuous data. We can see how networks change over time, but then you have to decide how are you going to aggregate those networks over time. And so obviously of that choice depends the structure of your networks and what's the natural time frame to aggregate those interactions is not a, a it's, it's not it's not a trivial question. So what's the natural time frame to do that? And there's a lot of research that is being developed thanks to big data or whatever to, to these high resolution data that allow us to understand a little bit better these time dynamics. But um, but it's not an obvious you know it's, it's again it's a choice that you need to justify. Um, so these, and, and this is particularly important because online communication is, um, you know, has peaks, there's peaks of activity and burstiness. And so this comes from one of my uh, research papers with co-authors in Spain. It's about the, some of you again have seen this before. It's about political protests and, and how protesters communicating uh, using Twitter to self-organize and sort of to coordinate those protests. And as you can see, there's a phase of exponential growth during which activity uh, in this stream of communication just goes wild. And now obviously that's changing. So if we think of the time window that you use to aggregate your network data, that's not stable. Sort of the right or the appropriate width, width of that time window changes over time as well. So in periods of high volume and high acti activity, you probably need to narrow down that time window to, to be able to assess um, you know, how things change because they change quicker. Um, and so this time dimension also changes over time and, so, and, and sort of the right scale to aggregate the data changes. And again, what's the optimum? I mean, it's an empirical question. Um, and it's the kind of things that we can sort of think about more carefully now because we have better data. But at the same time, we have to think carefully about these things because so we, could, we didn't need to think about them before. So summing up, um, Big data, yes, we have a lot of data, but we still need to sometimes filter it down so that we can really make sense of what that data is telling us. And um, this implies some sort of interpretation of what we have, and so we have to justify uh, the, the sampling logic that we choose. Um, if we are applying any filters so that we can go to the core of the action, then we, we need to have a, a sort of a justification for that too, uh, hopefully based on some sort of theoretical motivation. And then we have to think more carefully about how we aggregate that data because yes, high resolution means that you know, we can do things with more flexibility, but then we have to have good reasons uh, to do that. And I'm, I'm done. I think Fifteen minutes, <laughs> so you don't. You can take a break. I disclose at every talk that I am a vendor. I sell stuff. I was a professor. I still kind of am. We sold the software to a bigger company. Um, I made a little bit of money. I'll make some more money in the future if it all goes well. Uh, one thing academics should know about conflicts of interest: they're not bad unless you don't tell people about them. So what do I do? I work on uh, producing better human coding, or annotation, or tagging, or labeling. I want to improve the quality, the speed, the accuracy, the reliability of human coding. And we use that human coding to train machines. So we want to produce better machine classifiers. And if humans can't do it well, machines cannot do it well. It turns out most humans can't do it well, a small subset can do it okay, and very few can do it very well. 
So a little retrospective, uh, the first seven minutes of the talk is actually how I got here. Uh, back in 2001, I had my first NSF grant, and we were exploring the use of online communication to influence public decision making about regulatory rulemaking. So this was a slide I found, and actually all the slides you're about to see for the next seven minutes, it's one per year. I went through 13 years of PowerPoint decks to find something that I thought symbolized my state of mind. Uh, we were cyber optimists. I was a student of John Dreisek's in grad school. If you ever looked, read any of John's work, it's quite prolific on deliberative democracy. We went in looking for signs that when you put public communication online, it would get better. People could reflect, respond, and react to each other and engage with one another in a positive way. And I must admit, we spent years looking for it, and we never found it. Uh, part of what was driving the research, we also had some funding from the federal government, from the EPA, and a couple of other federal agencies. They had created a centralized portal. So anytime a rule is promulgated, that's four to 8,000 times a year in the US, and these have the binding power of legislation, but are produced by civil servants, the public has the right to comment, and they do so through regulations.gov. And it's actually an open and fairly transparent method for including people who aren't members of trade associations in public comment. The problem is, about uh, two or three years into the research, we had discovered mass email campaigns were the biggest problem. And I did a press release and a report at one point said, mass email campaigns may do more harm than good. Some of you may have done this. You get an email, said something terrible is happening, a fetus will be poisoned, a gray wolf will go extinct, et cetera, et cetera. And you send either a form letter or a modified form letter, in many cases, to the federal government, hoping that your numbers and your persuasive, pithy comments will dis determine the outcome of the deliberation. And in fact, I used to go around quite a bit by 2005 decrying the fact that this was actually just a data mining exercise by the groups, who in fact were not influencing public uh, decisions at all, but were lying to members in this case about the requirement of giving their name and their email address and their zip code because the exercise was really about collecting your name, your email address, and your zip code, and had absolutely zip to do with influencing public policy. And the groups got very good at doing this. The industry grew up around it, the public comment industry, and said openly on their websites, we'll raise more money for you, we'll grow your membership, and groups, especially environmental groups, engaged actively in these take action campaigns and raised a lot of money. Unfortunately, they rarely changed the outcome of regulatory rulemaking, and they engendered a lot of hostility amongst the agencies. So the big, you know, the bellwether moment in the history of this research and, uh, was when the polar bear was proposed for listing as an endangered species. Within minutes, every environmental group on the face of the planet had a polar bear on their homepage, and a click here to comment or donate now. And in fact, in this case, over 660,000 emails came in to one marine mammal biologist, and that was, I guess, big data, and still is, 660,000 emails, because the law required him to review those emails in 90 days. This was our early uh, prototype solution. Uh, it was built uh, at Carnegie Mellon University, where I had collaborated, a wonderful collaborator, Jamie Callan, in information retrieval, one of two computer scientists who really shaped my thinking. And we built a system that clustered all the duplicates and counted them and clustered the near duplicates and highlighted in yellow uh, the things that people added to form letters. And this was actually a fairly substantive edit. Many of them were things uh, not repeatable. And in my own social science research, I'm a political scientist, I came interested in these people who send two or three or four or five or 10 emails on the same rule because they were trying to convert what is a notice and comment process in, into a plebiscite. And it is not a plebiscite. The most votes don't win. And uh, what, what counts is writing meaningful comments. And so we started into talking about the notice and spam era where groups were raising money and people thought they were voting by clicking the button over and over again. By this point, I had started a little company. Uh, word of advice, don't do a startup when you're up for tenure. That's not a good, good timing thing. Um, but I was also reading good books. Uh, the Jarvis book is wonderful, got me thinking about building a platform rather than a piece of software and let other people create knowledge and value on top of that platform. 
And the Weinberger book I truly love, and I love David Weinberger, everything he's ever written. He's a genius, I think. The idea that different people can label things at different times for different reasons, and that's not bad. And I ran a little lab called the Qualitative Data Analysis Program for seven years where we coded other people's texts, so we learned a lot about how to produce faster uh, coding choices, more accurate, reliable coding choices. And our philosophy uh, derives about how we do text analytics directly from all of these years of coding public comments and now social media and other things as well. So coding is critically important. Human in the loop is a critical idea. And also, uh, along these lines, we discovered the value of crowdsourcing. We learned this best when we crowdsourced the coding of 22,000 bin Laden tweets uh, in a day and a half using 27 people. Uh, my goal is to create an expert crowd numbering in the hundreds or thousands so that if you have a coding project, you can put it up for bid and choose from the available coders who will get your coding done in 30 minutes or less. So no more weeks or months or years to do coding. I want it down to minutes. So where are we now? Uh, we're collecting lots of social data. Obviously, some of us are collecting more than others. Uh, I don't do big data. We do medium data. I don't, someone needs to come up with a word for medium data. I don't know what it is. It sounds stupid when you say medium data, but that's what we do. You know, we pull out collections. We're customers of GNIP. We love GNIP. So GNIP's a wholesaler of social data. We're a retailer. And uh, so we retail social data, and I loved uh, Sandra's comments about filtering. I'll say more about that in a second. Certainly social scientists uh, are a little slow to come to some of this stuff. I can remember, you know, being told, well, you know, you're, you're collecting the wrong data for the wrong reason at the wrong time. Uh, but in fact, uh, they're warming up to it, and, uh, you know, groups, uh, groups like Sherry's make it easier for us to make the case that this is meaningful research that can save people's lives, so that's good. And in fact, uh, looking at tweets is important. I don't like infographics. I wish people would stop creating them. I think they're needlessly reductive. I don't like fully automated sentiment scores. I think they're useless and inaccurate. No offense to anybody who's using them. Uh, but there's so much error in them, it's ridiculous. The chairman of the board of our company, Ed Hovey, uh, is one of the founding figures in NLP, and he doesn't believe in them, so neither should you. Uh, but there are ways to do sentiment knowledgeably, and, um, and there are other things you can do with automation that are good. Uh, so for example, this is, you know, these are tweets that mention Skype that were clustered. So they were deduplicated and they were clustered. We, the technique is simple. We look at every two words, compare it to every other two words, and we do that across all the documents in a collection. We come up with a measure of difference across documents. Makes it very easy if you've got a thousand versions of a tweet to review the full landscape of your data by looking at the seeds of the clusters rather than the thousand different iterations of the same idea. Big fan of search, we, there's a video, so I wasn't gonna do the, the smoking stuff here today. You can watch a great four minute video that features a big part of Sherry's team talking about how they do this. But searching and filtering is a critical component. You get big collections, you get more than you need, and you use search and filtering and clustering and deduplication to bring those collections down to something that is much more uh, manageable and that you can work with in a way uh, that, is, that is meaningful. So in her case, you know, they do care about smoking cigarettes, they don't care about smoking weed, they don't care about smoking barbecue, and I used my judgment not to put the image up of smoking hot girls, uh, but those are certainly some of the things that we came across in, in, in working together uh, to, to figure out what did they need to do first. And you'd be surprised how many people will show automated sentiment scores going up and down who have done no document disambiguation prior to calculating the sentiment. So you can imagine the spike uh, in positive sentiment about smoking hot girls. Uh, so what we use human coders, you know, to, uh, to do tasks that are small, code 500 items, code 200 items, code 100 items, and then we put multiple coders on the same task at the beginning to look at, you know, whether or not they're all doing it the same. And if I ask four coders to do something, they won't agree. If I ask them all to do it again a week later, they won't agree with themselves. It's not a bad thing but it's a real thing, and if you don't address the reality of that and incorporate it into your methodology, your methodology is weak. So when we first started building software, our first software piece is the Coding Analysis Toolkit. It's free, it's open source, it allows many people to code the same data set. Coding Analysis Toolkit, free, open source. 
And the first thing we did was build a measurement of interrater reliability, and the second thing we did was build a method for doing adjudication or validation, which is when you look at items where people disagree and come to some consensus or an expert determines who was right and who was wrong. So this is an example of what uh, adjudication looks like inside DiscoverText, which is our commercial product. You can try it for free for 30 days. You can run a whole project in 30 days and be done. Uh, so maybe it's free software as well, if you think about it. In this case, uh, um, there was one coder who was an outlier, and I would, in this, in this instance, validate the four coders who said, yes, this is Bloomberg News, and I would invalidate the work of the coder uh, who, who said uh, that this was not Bloomberg News. She's clearly wrong. One of the things we learn through validation or adjudication is sometimes a coder is way off track. You've got to find that person early in the project and not let them mess up your data. So here's a case where you know, one coder is right 97% of the time, another one 96, but one coder is only right 58% of the time. So a super good coder is right 90% of the time. A super average coder is right three out of four times, which means a quarter of their observations are wrong. A typical undergrad coder is right 50% of the time, which means they're wrong as often as they're right. Just measure it. That's all you need to do, and then you can deal with it fire some people. So filtering is huge. Love to build filters. Our system is completely predicated on the absolute value of filters and filtering. Uh, before this was all built, I used to talk to my computer science friends about, ooh, social scientists really need a slice and dice machine. You know the slap chop guy? Uh, the ShamWow slap chop guy? This is a slap chop for data, right? Uh, we filter through various methods. The coolest one right now is these interactive custom machine classifier histograms that allow us to focus in through filtering on sets of items that are slam dunk yes or slam dunk no, but even more interesting, everything that lies between 30 and 60% in, you know, in this kind of coding scheme is a, is a place where you can look at confusion items, where the classifier you're training is confused, and you go in and you code those ones and come to some resolution on the confusion items, and you find your classifier becomes more accurate much more uh, quickly. Um, so, Text analytics, by my definition, is a series of buckets. What I mean by that is you start with raw data and you use either search, filters, clustering, or human coding to create a sample. And then once you, once you code that sample, you can train a machine classifier off it. And then you can use that machine classifier as a filter and you create another sample. And so we successively go through a series of filtering exercises that iterate between filtering and coding and searching and all sorts of stuff. So the software we do this on right now is Discover Text. I am a salesman and I'm a vendor. I think I'm allowed to say it because I just want to be honest with you all. But if you sign up for the free trial, you can use Charles' wonderful GNIP power track for Twitter. We'll spot you 5,000 credits and you can go crazy with some of the, some of the rules. And that's my talk and I'm sticking to it. on its sender, that you need to be interested not just in how a message affects the people that are exposed to it, but what it's doing for the sender. That was something I hadn't really thought about, but I think it's a really important idea. Um, I'll open it up to questions, comments. Representative of everybody who's sending Twitter messages around these protests, 
And obviously, the best way of answering that question would be to have access to the full stream and then see, right? I mean, that's the entire population. Um, and, and so the next year, when we were planning on collecting the data again to track activity around the first, I mean, the, the protests that were organized to celebrate the first anniversary of the movement that we were analyzing, uh, that's when we thought, okay, so let's, we can't access the stream, the, sort of the full stream of information. Let's, let's just collect two independent samples, one in Oxford, one in Spain, using the two publicly available API search and, and, and streaming, and then let's see whether what we get is significantly different. And then on the basis of that, we can infer to what extent the streaming data, sort of the, the data you get through the streaming API, might differ from the overall population of messages that you're not getting. So our assumption, I guess, is that the smaller sample, sort of if there is, if there's more, what we find is that the smaller sample is biased towards the most central users. Sort of if, if, it's, if the smaller sample is better at tracking the activity of the most central users in the larger um, sampling, uh, um, streaming sample. And so our assumption is that the streaming sample is likewise biased to the most active users if you, if you could compare it to the, to the full stream of information. Um, I think in that case, if you, you compare using this, the data set with search uh, streaming API with field time function versus uh, search API with keywords, I think there is no like, unknown issues about this about the retrieving uh, process. If you look at the documentation, there is a clear you know, statement about how you can get, how the creator gives you data when you use search API. It is limited in the sense that the number of tweets you can get, etc. And if you use streaming API with filtering, you are getting all the tweets that contain your keywords. Unless you exceed 1% of all tweets, for example, if your keyword like smoking exceed, collect like more than 3 million tweets per day, then they will give you error message. But if you didn't get any get error message, it guarantees that you get all the tweets. Well, I know what the developer side says, but then when we, I know so the Twitter developer side has a lot of explanations as to how the whole thing works. But what the data says is that sort of first of all, I was surprised to see even though the overlapping is nearly complete, so the smaller sample is sort of mostly uh, uh, contained in the larger sample. But we still got messages through the search API, which has more restrictions than through the than we didn't get through the streaming API. I find that very puzzling. I don't know. With the same, I mean, we were using Q, we were using a list of hashtags in both cases. So I mean, so that we were using the same hashtags in both cases. The only thing, sort of what changes is the is the API that we use. So did they did they rate limit you when you were doing it? I mean, <coughs> did they rate limit you when you were using the stream API? Did they what? They Probably. rate limit. So if you're connected, they'll omit tweets if you exceed the rate limit, and there's messages that they'll give you indicating that. Um, and the other thing is they'll disconnect you, and if you re, which is, happens all the time, if you reconnect, your you miss data unless you specifically go back and request it. Right, so the street, so the, the data collection through the stream API was conducted in Spain just because they have better infrastructures than we have. Mm -hmm. they, have a, uh, they have a, they have a network of, I don't know, I think 100, 100 IP addresses. And I'm not, I'm not sure about how many uh, messages we got about discontinuing, so I don't I would, I would know. But, but basically what you're saying is, the so streaming API was why. missing messages that the search API gave you. And so that's a bug. Um, so you should tell them that unless you, it, but you have to make sure that you know that you didn't miss messages. Because like, I miss messages all the time because I have the right limits. But, but we miss messages in both instances. That's, I mean, we're right, but if you, but if you, but you specifically said there were things in the search API yeah, that yeah, weren't yeah. in the streaming API. Do you think API. that's due to those, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the to the disruptions in the in the in the downloading of information to the to the streaming API, is that what you're saying? That right. The, so I'm saying it, so if you found messages in the search that are yeah. not in the key that are not in the keyword stream, right? Um, then you should tell Twitter that because there's a mistake and it's it's likely actually a bug, and they even need to update the documentation. But my guess is because this happens to us all the time that the stream is missing messages, and they'll tell you that it's missing messages if you look for the rate tracking messages. Um, and I and we know that it's just the price you pay. Um, and if you basically you use the search API, you can get those, but it's kind of a hit or miss thing because of the back limit on the search. Is there a systematic bias to the those putting those rate limits, or is it on the user side? Uh, it's so you're limited to one percent of public tweets, 
but it's not per day, it's per, uh, I don't know what time frame it is, but it's, it's not per day. Because if it was per day, you'd kind of hit something at the end of the day, but you hit things throughout the day. Um, so and during high volume you, moments? Or, <coughs> what? During high volume moments? or Yeah, so it depends. So for example, if you're tracking, um, I don't know what's going on in the news today. Um, if you're tracking this event, which is, I'm sure, exceedingly popular on Twitter. So um, <laughs> let's say this event took up more than 1% of the total um, tweet traffic, then you wouldn't get it off. So if you're tracking part like Super Bowl, things like that, you're going to get rate limited uh, because of keywords. If you're just doing the sample uh, API, like the spritzer, um, then you're not going to hit the rate limits because they're only giving you that 1%. So actually, maybe maybe it's not. It's a kind of old concept, which is more related to search API. And actually, for the uh, streaming API, people do not, uh, it's, it's not typically called rate limit because it is there's specific conditions. You cannot use more than 400 keywords. You cannot follow more than 5,000, something like that. If you are within that boundary, there is no, unless you have some server connection issues or there is something maintenance going on on the Twitter side. So that's why I ask you about the comparison between streaming API and associate. Because in that case, it is not the issues around the something unknown process that Twitter gives us the data. Because we know that I mean, it is unknown whether the one percent. I mean, the, whether they are really giving us all the tweets, that's unknown. But if we can believe that, we are pretty sure that CM API gives you all the tweets that contain your keywords, unless you have more than four hundred keywords. No, no, no. no. So there, there is a, it's not called. You're right. It's not called rate limit. Um, the, 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 I can show you the messages, but there, if, if you read the documentation, they limit the keyword location user streams. Additionally, on top of what you're saying, they limit it to 1% of public traffic. Otherwise, traffic. you could search for the word the and get way more traffic on the public side. But I guess, so I guess, sorry, but, so, sorry, I have to say this. But so so the, the fact that we have some metrics in the search API that are known as something like that is not that relevant in the sense that it's a tiny. So I thought it was surprising. It's probably you're right that that's that sort of what you mentioned is probably the reason. What we are assessing in any case is the second order bias. So the kind of bias you get in the networks, you can reconstruct on the basis of those messages. Which is not a sort of, you have a sort of, you know, you have a bias in the number of messages you get, and in one case, in one, in one case the sample is smaller than in the other, just because it, the search API has more restrictions as to how much information you can download. But when you use that to reconstruct networks, that, that's the bias that we assess. And what we find is that it makes sense, right? So the bigger your data set, sort of, the better you are at tapping activity on the periphery of the network. And so the network is here. That's, right. that's about it. So, so, that's but, so again, it depends what you're trying to measure. So if you do, if you're using the search for keywords, yeah. then you're going to get the users who tweet more because they have more tweets. Uh, whereas if you're doing it based on the user ID, then you're going to have a different thing. So you, you have a, some sense of what you're getting by using the search mm -hmm. API because you know how you're doing it. Mm -hmm. So I've been, I've been listening for um, trends across the talks that are going in different directions. And I've detected two, and let's talk about one that's pertinent to this panel and to the previous panel. And it has to do with sentiment analysis. So we've had at least two speakers say sentiment analysis essentially, excuse the broad strokes and the brush here, sentiment analysis doesn't never use completely computerized sentiment analysis. And we've had at least three speakers, or three papers, that have said, let me show you what's so terrific about sentiment analysis using essentially computerized text analysis. I'm wondering if we can talk about where those differences come from and maybe how to resolve them a little bit, um, either in terms of you know the contexts of application, some kinds of limits and so on. Um, uh, full disclosure here, we've done a little bit of this ourselves and published at least one paper on something called word scores <clears throat> that was pretty successful. But in no way would I say that the, the analysis that we did in that paper is generalizable to any other data set with which we have any other kinds of, any other data outside of the contextual or topical domain within which we work. Um, that doesn't mean that word scores wouldn't work in those new domains, but rather that word scores would work in those new domains with retraining. So um, I'm wondering if we could, I, you know, there are like four or five papers. Oh, I think, uh, when this one? 
off temporarily. Four or five papers address this question. I'm wondering if we can have people address this to each other. I'll jump in and say that uh, you know I've been doing various forms of computer-assisted content analysis, mm -hmm. and I'm not someone who's doing a lot of machine learning, so I'm not kind of training a computer and then letting it go. Instead, we're we're creating a coding system, and whenever we develop that system, it's very customized to the context in which we're trying to code that language, and we're through an iterative process testing that coding system against that language, and ultimately when we feel confident we have 90, 95% agreement between human coders and the machines, letting the machine run everything, and then still doing a back-end validation, reliability check against it. And we have then done with a set of fairly abstract rules, like um, uh, emotional support, tested it from one setting to another. So from a cancer support community on breast cancer patients to caregivers for lung cancer patients, for example, not so different, but seemingly a little bit different, and found that it works really well. I haven't taken those same rules and tested it in a, a conversation about uh, uh, the Occupy movement. So I wouldn't dare to say how flexible those rules are. Um, sentiment, kind of positive, negative, I think what you were saying is those kind of generic positive, negative scoring systems, which I think there is some question about how generalizable those are across so many settings. It's what you see news organizations using, for example, just scoring, saying, oh, look, the sentiment of tweets on this are more positive than negative today, um, without any sense of what the underlying, and I think this goes to Sherry's conversation, which sometimes in particular categories of language, there's a lot of subtlety. Words that, you know, sick is a great <laughs> term among teenage boys, but not being used positively by many others, right? So um, I think in those cases, you really do have to understand language using context, and if that's a theme that I am you know tend to emphasize, it's, um, language use shifts dramatically from setting to setting, even within sentences, even among users. So uh, I'm skeptical of those generic systems too, but I think computer-assisted techniques are really powerful and, and can be used, you know, and we've done the same thing with news text, we've done the same things with blog posts, we've done the same thing with discussion posts, and found that the system itself works, though the rules have to change considerably. categorizing them as pro, con, pro. So one of the things was an experience that I shared with you in the discussion, but not more broadly, which was um, we talked about these data where we had research assistants code enthusiasm, right? So we had them do this gestalt rating um, on a scale from zero to 100, you know, how enthusiastic is this person? And we got great iterator reliability. But in the 20 minutes, what I didn't have time to tell you about was the sort of heartache that led up to that, working with our human coders and asking them to code some objective things. Like when I asked my, my coders to please count the number of positive adjectives, which you'd think would be a relatively straightforward task. Or when I asked them to count the number of facts that were communicated. Like these things that were more objective, but that, um, we haven't kind of evolved to do automatically, people were terrible at it. And we got crap in iterator reliability, like totally terrible. And so that was sort of what led to asking the humans to do the gestalt coding was, all right, this is something that we have kind of developed really sophisticated systems for doing. So it turns out people are really good at taking in all these various cues and synthesizing them, but not so good at figuring out why they feel that way. And so in our lab, when we think about tools like sentiment analysis, and Matt can talk about this in a more sophisticated way than I can, you know, I would ask the question, if you're gonna say sentiment analysis doesn't work, you have to say it doesn't work for what, right? Like, you have to say what the sort of problem you're trying to address is. And if you're trying to address what are the underlying linguistic mechanisms that contribute to some process you're interested in, well, it does, like, it works for, for that purpose for us. But in terms of, you know, other kinds of questions, I can see where, you know, when we look at the face validity of the coding that the sentiment analysis techniques produce, like, of course, it's not always apparent. But I would actually say that that's actually also really interesting, right? There are things that humans are good at figuring out and at sort of expressing, and then there are things that affect us, and we don't even know that they're affecting us. Mm. And so if there are ways that computers can help us figure that out, 
it's an answer to the question good at, you know, and fill in the blank is predicting something, maybe they can give us leverage, right? And even if it doesn't look like something that a human would recognize as what you'd expect, like that's also kind of exciting, right? So that's my immediate response to that question. Good add on that facts have been difficult since Dickens' time. Anybody who knows Thomas Craig knows facts are not always self-evident. Um, the real question, Joe, I think is what are the costs of a mistake? Right? And it's going to vary from project to project, to group to group, to data set to data set. If the costs of a false positive of a machine classification score are high, then you might say it's not working. If the costs of a false positive are low, or a false negative for that matter, then you might say it's working. Right? So it, well, I disagree. If, if, okay, good. If, somebody, if somebody's life is on the line, that's, that's one a different thing. question. It's, it's a different question. But you can apply that question to everything, right? I do. So, so, so <laughs> well, but it's, I, the same, it's the same for human coders. Yes. The doctor right. makes a mistake, a patient that's dies. Right. So yeah. you never have a system which is perfect. Of course, that's the so whole point. So I, I want to, I want to, uh, ask you to elaborate. I mean, well, I w let's let him finish his thought, and then well, we, hopefully we'll we be out of time. I want to say one more thing, though. Right? I think we should tease out this phrase called sentiment analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay. First of all, there is a difference between sentiment analysis as a goal versus sentiment analysis as a technique. Actually, we heard different usage of the sentiment analysis here. So I, I just want to separate, right? I think sentiment analysis at a, as a goal, we all know it is a, a, it, it is a positive goal, right? it's an interesting goal, Whether, but how we get there, right? Now, when you use the term sentiment analysis, I think you may have certain, certain mentality about the approach, right? And then, in fact, your use of what your encoder versus human machine learning technique is what we do, right? So when you use the term saying that you are referring to a specific simpler set of a technique, right? So, so I think it's important for us to tease out and not just you, because we may have picked the phrase sentiment analysis to, for particular usage. And, and so I think, we, actually, I heard a lot of common understanding. I think, you know, the, the interact, we all agree, number one, human coding is important. I haven't heard anybody says human coding, but, and we all, agree, number two, human coding is beneficial for sentiment analysis. And we all agree, number three, computer automated sentiment analysis or whatever analysis, opinion analysis, whatever, has room for improvement. Which we all agree. I wanted you to elaborate on that because it sort of seemed like a 20,000 foot dig saying, oh, uh, Ed Hovey told me he's an expert in NLP, but let's get to the details. Like, what exactly do you mean by sentiment analysis, and what are you claiming doesn't work, and why? You know, we are all scientists. I, Ed Hovey invited me for a talk, he's a good friend. Yeah. No, I'm not saying that he doesn't know his stuff. But what really is your claim? That's what I'm saying. The, the claim is that uh, the term sentiment analysis and the practice of sentiment analysis whether it's in uh, journalistic organizations, news organizations, maybe sometimes in commercial organizations that are trying to sell tools, is often overstated. But the, the claims that are made on what you can do, and you see this uh, commonly here, people make, well, we can't do sarcasm and irony, you know, as if those are the two things that we can't do. And I would just say that, you know, that it's more than a, it will be told me kind of moment. It's I've run uh, and trained uh, hundreds of coders put them to work on thousands of data sets and I've seen the results and I can ask people to code things as this green, yellow, or red and they will disagree. And sentiment is much harder than green, yellow, or red. And so all I'm saying, I'm, I, in my experience, the claims for it are overstated and when people do make a strong claim for it, all I'd like to see is that back-end validation where they give the things that are slammed up 95% positive or slam down 95% negative or above to 100 people and let them code it, not to one or two or three, but to 100 and see what the level of agreement is. Oh, I fully agree with what you said. Uh, like I said, we all agree. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. which, which, goes, which goes to the standard yeah. for which, for, 
against which to evaluate computerized text analysis. So for example, if the standard is that humans agree 80% of the time, ordinary humans who are literate, who uh, don't have emotional uh, lethargy, uh, and so on. Uh, well, in other words, if you, did, if, you did, if you did a reliability analysis among your human coders, got rid of those one or two who actually have negative correlations with all the other human coders, because they have some kind of problem. <laughs> Everybody else has from, from point one to point four correlations with the other human coders. My point is this. That the standard, if the st what's the standard? Is it you? Is it some gold standard? Or is it what humans could infer from sentiment who are at least among those that maybe Aristotle would call reasonable people? <laughs> and if they can agree to the extent of 85%, and the and your computerized text analysis can agree to 90% of that 80%, uh, that's not so bad. Not so bad. You know, not so bad, but then it's not, what not, it gets it's back not that it's 75% against some true standard. Right. Of, yeah. okay. Coding problems are like uh, dives in the Olympics, right? So there's a degree yeah. of difficulty yes. for every coding problem. Yes. Some are easy, and there's a right or wrong objective. I would call those hard bounded codes. A coder chooses the wrong code, they've made a mistake. In sentiment problems, it's a soft bounded code. Mm -hmm. Ten experts or reasonable people can sit in the room and disagree. Yes. And that soft boundedness of the code makes sentiment more slippery. Doesn't make it useless, doesn't mean we should throw it out, and it just means that you have to know when you go in and be sober about it, that picking your two favorite undergrads to do your sentiment coding isn't going to tell you a whole lot about the degree of difficulty of the task. And they won't be favorite undergrads for very long. Well, <laughs> they all have done all this coding. And the problem is not just two out of four that are going to be outliers or two out of six. The layering of how different people's education, life experience, views on sentiment, views on language, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Meaning that if you had 100 coders, See, but the flip side You're of just going to see a lot of variation. The flip side of that, Stuart, then, is that if the humans are so fallible, then then shouldn't we trust the machines more? I mean, they're, they're more systematic. I mean, you're, no, you're kind no, of making, you're I making the argument. Fallible. No, the machines well, are trained. Right, exactly. Using, I mean, I think this is a, this, they're all, it's not one or the other, right? I mean, the, the machine learning is as intelligent as the, the people who are training the system to produce it, are, are selecting the examples are going through the process of how many they're picking, how well they're training the system, how complex their algorithm is. So it's not a this or that. It's not one or the other. It's about the amount of invested effort and the, and the clarity of the system and how well you're then back end validating it if right. you're making sure it's working well. So I mean, I, I think these kinds of broad statements become very dangerous very quickly. And so I, it's a good corrective, Joe. Thank you. I would like to just tail on to what you're saying because I think that there's a couple of themes emerging in this discussion and kind of more broadly today that really resonate with me. And one, and I forget who said it so I can't give proper credit, but they were talking about how labor intensive this is. And at the end of the day, I think part of the, the challenge that all of us are facing is that the media and you know the publishing industry, you know, the news industry is kind of sloppily saying we do sentiment analysis, we looked at all the positive tweets and applying like a very black box approach that I think everybody in the room recognizes as a little bit potentially misleading at minimum. Um, so the fact is that everybody here is working on understanding rigorously and being transparent about it and we're working in a, I don't want to say industry, but a field where there's also, it, it's exciting. There's so much data that you can just like, look at it and see hypotheses and findings and interesting things. And the temptation is to say, well, this is how it is because 10 million people on Twitter said that without going back and saying, well, who were these 10 million people? How did you get those 10 million people? What exactly are they talking about? Are they talking about what you think they're talking about? Are they 10 million out of 500 million? And in that case, what is what they're saying generalizable or is it very particular to that group? And so I think if we are rigorous and transparent about each step along those ways, we can really claim the, the rigor and the, the just bonanza of data that are out there. But without that, 
it's just voodoo. And for me, that's the great gift of computer science to social science. Ed Hovey and Jamie Callan taught me to measure everything. I would just add to that, I think the theme that you have kind of seen, and I don't know if this is your second point, Joe, is I think there's a great call for us being much more transparent about our methods, much more rigorous about what are kind of common assumptions about how we choose to both collect data and then how we choose to analyze and share that data that far too often, and I think sometimes it's the computer scientists that are the most guilty of this, you know, they have the three page, four page paper where they don't get into the details of the methodology, right? If I, I, I look at the abstracts or the, the proceedings in uh, ICWSM, sometimes they're extremely short and you don't have those details. Uh, uh, and so, you know, I think there is really a need for us to move towards more, just not just a systematic approach, but hold each other accountable uh, and say, okay, you weren't clear about your methods, detail this, provide an appendix. Uh, uh, show me your, uh, and, and in political science, for example, there's, there's a big push towards data sharing. You know, and I think we're going to see more of that here too, because the lack of transparency means how can we trust what's behind the numbers if we don't even know it was used to construct the data set, or how that data set was formally analyzed. And so I think, I, again, I, I appreciate John's work partly because he's very transparent yeah. about how he's going about doing the scoring, how well it's working, the number of false positives, the numbers of false negatives. That's what we need more of. We're not seeing enough of that. I agree, and it, it goes. It, touches on the spirit of rigor and you know being scientific about it but it's also part of you know contributing to the community I mean, we're everybody's making it up as we go along so we're all bringing our own discipline to it and our own vocabulary that often is the exact same thing as somebody else is doing using different words but if we're not fully transparent about it and fully descriptive we're not going to be able to learn from what others are doing I should also acknowledge that really the kind of tool you develop, you know, the, really it's very useful you know, the, to facilitate, for example, intercoder validation. I love to uh, definitely try it out, you know, because you know it's all you know chicken egg problem, right? The more we can have validated coders, the more we can use the outcome of those coded results to build computer programs, and then we can use the computer program to test the false positive, false negative, and then go back and, and then look at intercoders whether there were additional insights that could explain the false positive, false negative. So I think that's, that, that's also a very active research in machine learning, right? Interactive learning, transfer learning. You know, this is, I think, the, this is a really a fascinating topic. I want to build a little bit and go, maybe go a little bit someplace else with, it, with these ideas. So it seems to me you all focus very much on inside the ballpark analysis. That is, if I code it, uh, sent it uh, the, the sent it, the positive sentiment of the, of the contributor to this network uh, um, using this, this coding scheme, will it show up if I use this coding scheme? Will they say the same things twice? But what I care about, of course, is whether that affects their health some outcome. Mm. And is there some tension here between using as a criteria the match between my internal two measures as, oh, now I got it right. In fact, isn't there some tendency for that to become, to, to focus on measures that you can get internal reliability about, as opposed to measures that actually predict uh, the outcomes that you care about, which is, are people healthier? Do they follow the advice of their physicians more often? Do they live longer? Uh, if they have lung cancer. Um, yeah. Is there some tension here? There is. There is. I'll tell you exactly what it is. People used to come to the lab all the time with a goal of getting their inter-rater agreement above a certain arbitrary level. If that is your goal as a researcher, and everything else falls by the wayside, all you have to do is make a very simple hard boundary coding. So there is that tension. And what's also interesting is some people think that they have to get the agreement to find things that are valid to report in a journal, to get an academic publication. But in fact, as a qualitative researcher, I would say always, almost in every case, the most interesting data is the stuff that's difficult to code, that people can't agree on. It's the stuff that doesn't fit neatly into a category, that can't be easily, it's where the subtlety, where the nuance, it's where all the qualitative meaning resides. And so people come into the lab and they want to get 0.8 on their iterator reliability. I say, well, I don't want to do that. Let's just make that code scheme as dead simple as possible. But then you also can predict the outcome before you do the research. 
right? And the interesting stuff is the stuff that never fits anywhere that you've got to spend time with looking at closely. Why can't anybody agree what this is or where it goes? There's something unique here. And really, I often think what I'm building is a system for finding things that don't fit in categories rather than a thing for putting things into categories. And can I add to this? Uh, I, I kind of see, I, I want to kind of uh, uh, change the, the perception from intercoding val uh, validity to this qualitative research. Right? I think qualitative research in, in health domain is more closely related to your question. Because in qualitative research through interview, through a focus group, through whatever, right, you know, journal writing, analyze you know, what they say, what they write, you know, and all of that as qualitative study uh, through coding and so forth. I think the conversation we are having right here actually point out a tremendous opportunity to complement that, not to replace, but complement those qualitative uh, analysis, which is trying to link, right, link uh, whatever interesting qualitative study to health outcome, right? Whether it's a stress, whether it's motion, whether it's a belief, whatever, right? So, so now we have all these tools. Now we can then build on top of or complementary to those qualitative coding to have computer-assisted qualitative analysis, which is really the goal of computational social science. That's an excellent and summary, I think, of this session. That was beautiful. Um, so we are right on time. Let's take a few minutes and get some caffeine and sugar to get us through this last lap. <laughs>